Richard, thanks for joining me today. Um, our topic is, is, is a bit um, perhaps unfamiliar to most people, but I want to begin with um, a strange question, uh, and that is you're a sociologist, but you've spent hours observing ants. And while I find insects endlessly fascinating, how does a sociologist justify doing research on ants? Sure, that's a good question. The vast majority of sociologists, I don't think, would be caught dead uh, <laughs> looking at ants or most other non-human species as well. But ants are extremely interesting because with the exception of recent human societies, which means 10,000 years ago forward, the ants, the bees, the wasps, and the termites are the only social species to have built huge complex societies with uh, extremely large populations numbering into the millions and organizing themselves with a complex division of labor that's executed by specialists. So by looking at ant societies, I think we can get a window on some of the basic, if you will, design problems associated with putting together really large complex societies. Right, so we've got the insect model of the human society. And this whole notion arose I guess, uh, peaked in a sense, or, or, or emerged in the 1970s with, with the concept of sociobiology. Right. So just sort of in a nutshell, um, so, since that's a term and a concept we're going to be using today, what is soci sociobiology? What do we mean when we say a person is a sociobiologist or we, we use sociobiology to study um, social systems? Okay. Well, I think the simplest answer is that sociobiology is the study of the biological bases or foundations of social life, of any social species. And now there are about 20,000 social species that have been documented. Um, another way of defining it is to say that it's the study of patterns of social behavior that are the product of evolution by natural selection. So I think those two definitions cut to the heart of what sociobiology is about. Okay, well that seems pretty harmless in a sense, right? We're, we're using standard procedures of evolutionary framework to understand some biological phenomenon. But when this book came out, and uh, this, is, this is my copy uh, from, from about 1980, and you can tell it's my copy from when I was in college because it only cost $12.50. a bargain. Yeah. <laughs> um, when this came out, there was a firestorm of controversy. There were debates within the, you know, the, the halls of science and the malls of America, right? right? Yeah. So what about sociobiology made it such a, a lightning rod? Why yeah. were pe especially sociologists, right. why, were, why were they so incensed by this? Right. Well, uh, as I recall, the book has 27 chapters, and the first 26 chapters were really not very controversial uh, or would have caught the attention of many people except biologists, behavioral biologists in particular. But chapter 27 was all about humans, okay? And so when E.O. Wilson, the author of Sociobiology, extended his analysis to the study of humans, this upset a lot of people, including social and behavioral scientists. There are several reasons for this, I think, one of which was we had, and by we I mean social and behavioral scientists, had uh, sort of an ugly experience with a vulgar form of uh, Darwinian evolutionary thinking or called social Darwinism mm -hmm. in the late 1800s right. and the early 1900s. Um, and social Darwinism basically attempted to explain differences among societies and groups of people on the basis of presumed biological differences among those people. And it's not very scientific, it's pseudoscientific at best, uh, but we were party to some of that and we want to put that behind us. We feared, many people feared sociobiology involved a resurrection of this kind of thinking. I think a second reason is that without question, culture is a powerful driving organizing force in human experience and mm -hmm. a lot of social scientists feel that if you're going to try to explain human social behavior with culture, you can't also consider biology, that they're somehow mutually exclus exclusive explanatory approaches. That is incorrect, I think, but that was a great fear, that somehow biology would take over culture. And the third reason is that, simply enough, most sociologists uh, are not trained in biology. Mm -hmm. uh, a psychologist, if you were to want to earn a PhD in psychology, you'd probably have to learn something about the brain. Uh, in anthropology, there's a long, rich tradition of biological uh, studies of non-human species, especially monkeys and great apes. Mm -hmm. We don't have that tradition in sociology. So I think that was a big obstacle to sociologists being interested in or receptive to this. So 
I mean, sociobiology has recently sort of been extended in some ways to what, what we're now calling evolutionary psychology. Right. You've done work on, on, on uh, sociobiological accounts of religious behavior. Others have talked about uh, the, the evolution of ethics. Is there reason for us to be concerned, I mean, in, in a social and political sense about these sorts of explanations? Well, I guess there's al always good reason to be vigilant. Uh, I mean, any time you propose any sort of broad, ambitious explanation of human behavior, it always is wise to maintain an era or an attitude of skepticism, okay? On the other hand, I think by bringing evolutionary explanatory principles to the study of phenomena that seem very far removed from biology, like ethics and religion and religious experience, we might get entirely new ideas, we might generate new hypotheses, we might get uh, some purchase on these phenomena that otherwise we wouldn't have. With regard to, say, both religion and ethics, for example, um, sociologists who are now using evolutionary reasoning uh, have tended to focus in on the extraordinary range of emotions that humans have. If you mm -hmm. compare the parts of the brain uh, that are implicated in emotional life among humans to other mammals, including even other great apes, if you will, uh, humans have a really rich uh, range of emotions. And uh, increasingly, the interpretation of sociologists working in this area is that we may have acquired this, this emotional uh, range of capabilities for negotiating very complex social challenges. That is, for winding our way through uh, everyday life uh, and for assisting us in behaving in a manner that will help us maintain membership in good standing in mm -hmm. cooperative groups. So by having the capability of embarrassment, um, indignation, um, having capabilities of guilt, these sorts of things, these are very useful in sort of keeping people from behaving in a way that would jeopardize social life and would jeopardize their positions in social life. And if you overlay that with uh, meaning systems like religious beliefs, that adds an element of, of potency to it, of mm -hmm. power to it, of veracity to it. And basically evolutionary thinkers think or contend we might have some of these capabilities because they aided our ancestors in the sure. distant past uh, to cope with various, of, various aspects of life, social challenges. If you well, thank you, Richard. I, uh, I, I think that's a, 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 a sociobiology in a nutshell, and I, and, uh, I thank you for spending some time with me. Thank you. I enjoyed our conversation.